Alrighty, YouTube, welcome back to another episode. So we're going to be continuing uh, this Rembrandt in this um, Master Study series. Again, I'm going to be showing you the video uh, in real time. You're going to be seeing, uh, if not every single brush stroke, pretty much all of the brush strokes involved, or most of the brush strokes involved in the development of this Master Study. So let me go ahead and show you what colors we're using currently. Now on the palette here we have Titanium White from Winsor Newton, we have uh, Flake White from Williamsburg, Gamboge Lake Extra, Old Holland, we have Yellow Ochre Deep, Old Holland, we have Cadmium Red, Vermilion, Williamsburg, we have Alizarin Crimson, Lake Extra, Old Holland, we have Raw Umber, Winsor Newton, Ivory Black, Williamsburg, and we have Ultra Marine Blue. Williamsburg, which mind you, I didn't really use the Williamsburg Ultra Marine Blue, not that you can see it in the camera angle, but there it is. I didn't quite use it um, for the colors that you're seeing here. These are the colors that I uh, pre mixed for the flesh tones in the last episode. If you are interested in seeing how I mixed these flesh tones, go ahead and check out, excuse me, go ahead and check out. Uh, last week's uh, episode. As I said before, uh, I am showing you pretty much all of the footage that I can show you in the development of each one of these paintings and this master study series. We're going to be using the same type of process rather than jumping around individual different uh, procedures. We're going to be using the same type of process to ensure uh, the best results. In this little container I have um, a distilled turpentine and this one I have the spike oil uh, since we are still building the color up with the first flesh tone at this moment I'm just using the spike oil in this container here to thin out the paint whenever necessary and the photo reference for this Rembrandt master study the photo reference that you're seeing over there will be um, linked in the description box down below for you or you can just go to google arts and culture and type up rembrandt and search for this image i highly recommend using google arts and culture as i mentioned in um, the last episode uh, this is my favorite type of panel a wooden panel at the moment to use this is a uh, ampersand gesso board that I'm working on. I'll have links to all of the materials that I'm using in the description box down below. Amazon affiliate links. So you can go ahead and purchase the same type of materials that I'm using. And as I mentioned last time, it's important to note the surface that you're working on for portraiture or anything that you're trying to take to uh, some kind of degree of uh, refinement or finish you want to work on either a smooth panel such as this one or you want to work on a uh, oil primed linen a uh, fine textured very fine textured oil primed linen so either that linen that I just described or this is the uh, optimal surface to work on just because it's very smooth and you don't have too much noise uh, from the uh, texture of the canvas so that is I probably wouldn't use something like a cotton canvas anymore for something uh, that we're trying to refine and again just like last the last episode I'm still in the same stage so um, you're watching this now in the very far future uh, I'm not trying to vary the color that much and right now I'm looking for uh, shape and value more than I am color and we're building up the color in this way. I realize that this is quite distracting, uh, so I may go into this uh, hat later today, but it's not bothering to me too much just yet. So again, if you wanna see uh, a longer segment of uh, me talking about the colors, if you missed last week's episode, go ahead and check that one out. Um, and uh, you'll see the uh, the way that I mixed up all the colors that I'm using for for this. And uh, this week's episode will we will just be continuing to build the color or build the form. Uh, 
I'm working in uh, 20 minute intervals. So I have my camera literally right next to my head. Of course it's at a it's at an angle with respect to the to the painting. But about 20 minutes at a time of painting footage. Then I take a break. Then I film again. So I'll do about three of those this week. And uh, again, this master study series, though it has much less views, uh, I think that what uh, hopefully the result will be that uh, people that are more interested in learning the uh, the art of painting will be watching these videos more than say the ones that I was doing before, where I was using the uh, copyright free uh, photography images. Now I'm really gearing towards uh, those that really want to learn. I think it's important to observe what I'm doing with each plane uh, in order to gain insights into things that I probably wouldn't be able to explain as well verbally. I will do my best to explain uh, what I'm doing to you verbally, but I think, especially for this episode, I'm going to be getting into some more of the nitty gritty, so to speak, kind of things. So I won't be speaking as much. But again, I put myself in your position, um, wanting to learn the art of painting, and I think it's important to have as much exposure to uh, painting as possible. A little nervous about getting towards the mouth, so I think I'll start with the uh, dark of the sorry, the surrounding darks first. Again, please check out last week's episode for more specific information on the color mixtures, but the color is not as important right now as the drawing.
And I think one of the things that makes portraiture in particular so difficult uh, versus painting any other type of subject is that uh, we we observe faces with a different kind of uh, we employ a different kind of uh, observation towards faces and as a result the uh, the viewer is not as forgiving with faces so any little mistake uh, is a big big thing to the viewer and in the beginning we make a lot of mistakes and that's just the way it is that's the process so that is what makes this a little more difficult But I don't know. I've always been drawn to uh, painting portraits or faces in particular. Now I'm going to use that darker color that you saw me mix before. The uh, Lizard and Crimson Lake Extra Old Holland. The Ivory Black Williamsburg. Now that is dark. And again, I'm trying to walk my way towards the mouse. So sometimes rather than just jumping right into the mouse, um, I think it's a better idea to work around it and then see how the mouse fits into the surrounding shapes. And I'm thinking of relative distances. This is how I'm drawing. So I'm thinking of the distance from here to here relative to the distance from uh, here to here. So I'm going to have to move the mustache. And 
and just relate one point to another point. And another thing I should notice on a uh, mention on a technical, um, just a technical note, um, not not painting related, but uh, this video related. In the past, I have lost footage um, from my camera, or in particular my memory cards, uh, filming longer durations of uh, videos. So, if there are any instances where the video is lost I apologize but again I'm trying to show you as much as I possibly can by filming uh, 20 minute intervals at a time And if you have the patience to watch all of this footage and draw or paint along with me, then you certainly have the patience that it takes to continue to progress as an artist. Because this is definitely a patience thing. Uh, it's interesting to meet or hear other uh, classical or I guess realist artists talk. They're very soft-spoken uh, sometimes and uh, not always <laughs> clearly not always but um, they're very meticulous even the ones that uh, try not to seem as meticulous they're pretty meticulous But that's something you can learn. Um, you can learn to exercise the patience 
needed to do this kind of painting. Because in the beginning it was hopeless looking, wasn't it? Um, earlier on, and it's still a little bit hard to look at, but you have to trust your ability to have patience and draw. The more patience you have with the process, the more you will learn new things with each and every painting. Even each and every session in a painting, you'll learn something. Now I'm just now starting to get to the mouth. And we're about to pass a uh, 20 minute interval now. Which means I will take a break. And then we will resume painting again. Sometimes you really have to pull me away from my painting for me to stop. All right, I'll take a break now. And I'm back. So welcome to another 20 minute interval in this painting. I may or may not uh, show some clips of the palette in the beginning of these uh, 20 minute intervals. We have one left after this one uh, this week. Uh, so we're continuing to develop over here. Now, I was a little timid to jump into the mouth before, so uh, just a note, if you're a little timid about jumping into a certain area, just work around it, and then um, it's a little bit easier to make the uh, transition. And so, let's continue with these colors. And again, I feel like uh, the Cadmium Red Vermilion from Williamsburg is really one of the nicest reds that I've used for flesh tone painting. Again, this is not paid sponsorship or anything. I kind of wish it was, but it's not. Um, and uh, it's just a really nice orangey red. And then when you uh, when you neutralize it with the raw umber and add a touch of yellow ochre, it's nice. <laughs> it's nice when you have that kind of transition in color. But I digress. We're we're drawing more right now than we are coloring anything in. So let's continue to work around the mouth. Now clearly uh, it's easier to witness what's going on down here. So if I see something that's easier to put in, I will gladly put that in first before jumping into something that is a little more difficult. Now if it's too warm, which it appears may not be that way on camera, but if it's too warm, that's when you jump to raw umber. The Winsor Newton raw umber is starting to annoy me just because it's a, a little more oily so it is throwing me off uh, from the consistency or the paint drag uh, that I feel with the uh, raw umber or oh, sorry with the uh, Williamsburg and uh, Old Holland. So I'll, I'll most likely upgrade my uh, 
raw umber pretty soon. In fact, that's what I was doing during the break. I was shopping for some colors. Now, if I want it to be drastically cooler, then I'll jump to the ivory black. Ivory black is a really nice bluish color on its own. So again, I'm just going for what is easiest to observe or what is, what is easiest to describe with each step. This is definitely not a bravura, bravura, or however you pronounce it, type of approach. Um, where in a, a more bravura type of painting, you'd be going and like uh, big, big areas of color, big notes, and um, yeah, that's what I would do before, but now, you know, now having much more control with the smaller brush. Much more relaxing at this stage in my life. And um, expression is another thing you want to think about with the face, especially when you're working with the mouth in comparison to the other shapes up here. Um, Rembrandt has kind of nonchalant look to him. He's like kind of, you know, just chilling, just hanging out kind of. His eyebrows raised here. He's like, oh, all right, guess we're going to be painting now. So now you see why I'm going back and forth uh, between eyebrows now and mouth. This really helps to describe expression here and here, which is not something I usually talk about with painting because I usually don't get there. Um, I usually didn't get there with my previous paintings, but now we're taking a very more refined approach and look at these paintings. I also forgot to mention that on uh, my Patreon, beginning at the $2 a month support tier, you also uh, have access uh, to, well, the supporters tier has access to the uh, behind the scenes videos, so I make a behind the scenes episode each week. It's uploaded on Saturday, along with the main YouTube video. Um, and uh, every level above the $2 level uh, also has access to that um, uh, the behind the scenes video So I'm bouncing from here to here to try to observe that expression. Uh, there's a learning curve with these uh, higher quality oil paints. If you're used to something like uh, Winsor Newton uh, or Gamblin, not saying that they're low quality oil paints, they're definitely 
artist quality oil paints, don't get me wrong, but um, there's a little bit of a learning curve with the thickness uh, in paint drag. Uh, that is the drag of the brush stroke on the surface. I suppose the next level above that would be mixing your own paints. But then again, I'm pretty trusting of uh, Williamsburg and Old Holland with their individual paint qualities. Another brand you can look at for high quality uh, paints is Rublev. Um, I, I like Rublev for the mediums. I use Rublev's mediums whenever I'm glazing and stuff. to red, so raw umber. Now not a lot is going to happen. Uh, with each upload now uh, in this Master Study series, uh, but it's going to be much, much more involved. So now I'm actually going to use the Spike Lavender to clean off the brush. And I'm also taking note that each time I clean off the brush uh, with Spike Lavender or Turpentine or, or whatever, uh, it will introduce a little more of a thin thinness to the paint so I'm very careful to dry off the brush as much as I can before I resume painting with it. But I cannot emphasize enough how important the uh, surface that you're painting on is, especially for portraiture. You need to get a very fine grain, or fine grain, I keep saying grain, a fine textured um, oil prime linen or a really nice panel such as this ampersand gesso board. The ampersand gesso board is the, definitely the cheaper option, but I mean artists have been painting on wooden panels for centuries. Wooden panels have shown to be very, very archival. Whenever I move the brush like that, it's usually because I'm just kind of comparing relative points like this point to this point. Now you're seeing slowly but surely, slowly but surely.
And the nice thing about having a technique like this that's consistent for each painting is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel each time. Which is like, I'm kind of at fault for doing that with my previous videos, but it was a fun exploring process in the past, but now, now we're really getting serious. Now, at this, in this segment, I'm thinking a lot, uh, a lot more about uh, expression, his expression, than I was in the previous ones. And to those of you that are also creators, our video, uh, video people here on YouTube. You you know that what I'm doing is kind of uh, creator suicide in a way that I'm splitting up these videos and slowing down the process. Uh, but what I'm trying to do is put out the most information, uh, the most painting footage that I possibly can following this technique. Uh, in order to gear this towards more uh, serious students, uh, more serious viewers that want to learn and then and if you want to take your learning even further I have the online classes for you. But if you really want to learn uh, definitely spend a lot of time looking at the master's work. I'm not calling myself the master but the photo reference, the uh, the Rembrandt. Spend a lot of time looking at the Rembrandts. Velasquez, Sargent. Uh, but you really want to pick a particular school of painting, a type of painting that you want to do. Uh, if you want to stick with uh, bravura painting, um, meaning a la prima painting, I'd highly recommend learning this first, mastering the classical, uh, more layered approach before jumping into the, uh, say, the John Singer Sargent, Carlos Duran type of approach. Because if you jump into that without any knowledge of how to build up a classical painting, it is very difficult, and I'm speaking in, uh, to you with experience on that. And uh, I do have a la prima paintings that I do in that style. Typically I prefer to do landscapes in that way. Um, but for the most part, um, what I want with these videos is to have a very specific and concise method for the uh, learned viewer. For the learned viewer viewer that wants to learn. <laughs> the expression that Rembrandt has is so lovely. He's just kind of like, for those of you that, that know the terminology, he's like, sup. Sup, yo. I'm just painting. Cool. Cool. Using old Holland? Yeah, man. That's right. <laughs> that's the kind of lingo I have with my buddies, so uh, that's just how we speak. I try to be more formal, of course, for video. Kind of like having a dialogue with Rembrandt.
That's the 90s talk, by the way. I grew up in the, the 90s. The 90s Maryland, Marylander talk. But anyway, I digress. Now we're uh, approaching another 20 minute mark, so I'm just going to go ahead and cover up this uh, angle. See how I'm slowly drawing, trying to create more and more specificity. I'm also utilizing the fact that the background has faded or sunk in. I didn't go ahead and oil out anything. Uh, usually I wait to do that till the very end so that there's not too much of a buildup of oil and I'll show you how I do that and if you're on on my online classes then you know how I do that now by now And the art of painting really teaches you how to slow down your, your seeing. You're seeing things in sequence, slowing down the rate at which you take in information so that you see more specific information. All right, we're just past the 20 minute mark, so let's go ahead and take a break. And as mentioned before, I'll show you a little segment of what's going on with the palette and the mixing space. Uh, so again, this is the palette that I use for my studio work. I think this is the palette that I'm going to stick with. As you know, I've been jumping around uh, different variations of uh, palettes to use, but this just, I don't know, this is a setup that I find to be much, much more convenient for me. And again, these flesh tones that you saw me mix up in uh, the previous episode, um, they, they're they still here. I tint them once in a while. So uh, for instance, I'll show you how I do that. So here's my spike lavender. Uh, I'll just clean the brush off the best that I can with the paper towel. Okay, so as much as I possibly can, and then once I'm confident that uh, a lot of the paint is, is a, or sorry, a lot of the spike lavender is off the brush, then suppose I wanted to tint, I don't know, suppose I wanted to tint this darker flesh tone uh, a little bit warmer, so uh, we just take a little bit of the uh, cadmium red vermilion, but just a dab, a little tiny dab. I know that um, a la prima painters will say, don't paint with dabs of paint, paint with plenty of paint. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, that's the way that uh, you do with a bravura type of painting. But again, this is much more controlled, much more slow and steady. So just mix a little bit of it into this and it helps to tint it. And what you achieve when you have these colors premixed in this way uh, is that you have a sense of unity within your flesh tones so that there are not too many uh, indistinct jumps between chroma if you have too many jumps in chroma in your flesh colors uh, it tends to make the painting look a little bit more choppy a little more um, I don't know, artificial, so actually what I want is something that's a little darker and more neutral. And like I said, if I want it to be more neutral, raw umber does the trick. Again, this raw umber is annoying me because it's a different consistency than the um, higher quality paints. The other ones, this is a Winsor Newton, so I'm going to be upgrading this to a, um, most likely a Williamsburg. So again, just a little darker. So I want this relative value, but again, I'm taking from this, making this a little less warm with the raw umber. And that's how I go about uh, 
tinting the colors a little bit. So now let's continue to develop the painting. And we're back. This will be the last 20 minute interval of this session. So let's continue with that color that you saw me mix up with the raw umber and that darker flesh tone. And what you get out of this is a, a very relaxing method of painting that produces very high quality results. We're not there yet, clearly. We're not at a you know high level of finish yet. And that's just to show you that this is something that takes time. I'm not gonna rush you through something and not give you as much information as you need to paint along. I, I want to, again, gear this towards people that really want to learn. As a result, I will lose a lot of views, I'm sure. It's kind of funny, YouTube gives you a warning, uh, kind of warning when they're, they're like, uh, your audience doesn't like this content. But again, I'm gearing this towards those of you that really want to learn. It was fun jumping around from different techniques before, but now we're definitely going to stick with this approach. And again, the purpose of this uh, layer is not to finish anything. The purpose is to draw. The more accurate we can draw, the more our painting will look like the Rembrandt. Now is the time where I'll use a little bit of spike lavender, just a tiny bit of spike lavender to get the paint to flow a little bit. Knowing this will sink into the panel later on when this dries. And 
I like to compare the ear uh, to the nose, so I think now I can double check. Uh, the ear is a little closer to the bottom of the nose on a horizontal. So I'll raise the ear a little bit. So a little bit of spike lavender goes a long way. So the paint is very movable now. So it's not something I would want in the flesh tones, but I'm using it to draw around the face. So again, I'll either I'll either use uh, distilled turpentine or I'll use spike lavender for this. And usually I'll use um, I'll use Gamsol or odorless mineral spirits, some other type of odorless mineral spirits, just to clean the brushes uh, at the end of the day. I actually like to put a little bit of uh, linseed oil, cold pressed linseed oil on the palette, or just uh, refined linseed oil on the palette by the end of each sitting just to continue to build a nice surface for the palette And I'm doing this um, just to put a little more contrast between the flesh tones. And so that once this uh, dries and fades in, it'll create a nice um, outside edge for these shapes. The ear is in the bottom of the nose on a horizontal. I'm just letting the paint kind of scrape away off of the brush just to ensure that there's not too much of a sharp edge where I don't want there to be a sharp edge. This is okay because I'm going to want to differentiate that. Now clearly, I had the width off, uh, had the face a little too wide on this side before, so I'm now able to push it. Remember the camera is at an angle uh, with respect to the painting, and don't worry, I'll show you um, before we end this week's episode, I'll show you what the, it looks like front and center, which I think I forgot to do with last week's. And the nice thing about uh, these paints in particular is that they stay put. You put the brush stroke down, it stays there, especially with the flake white. It's still, you can still move the paint around. It's not 
that tacky kind of feeling when the paint starts to dry, but rather it's it's got a little bit of resistance to it, which allows you to sculpt a little bit better. So again, I'm going to tint uh, the middle tone area with the vermilion, cadmium red vermilion. And you do not want to have a vermilion hue or anything hue, anything that says hue, especially a vermilion hue. You do not want that. Um, that is the student grade version. That's the kind that has the a uh, little too much additives to the paint. You also want to stay away from Winton, not Winsor, but Winton uh, oil paints. Those are the student grade. I mean, that, you can start with that. That's fine. I certainly used that for a while in the past, but you really notice a difference with uh, using artist grade versus student grade. And then, when you jump into um, higher quality like Williamsburg and Old Holland, man, you can really, you really appreciate the quality of the paints when you're, when you're using these kind of paints. And you've been using something like a, uh, again, like a Winsor or Gamblin for a long time. Not to hate on those brands, but I'm just giving you my honest opinion. And the water mixables are, are nice to use too. Uh, not my preferred, but um, again, I've used them in the past to to show that it is possible to use water mixable. Just know that they kind of take a long time to dry in general in comparison to traditional. They're kind of marketed as drying faster, but I, I didn't notice that to be the case. Uh, I've tried uh, the Artisan Winsor Newton, which again I would not recommend. I've tried the Holbein, uh, which I wouldn't recommend, of the water mixable. And then I tried the Cobra water mixable, that's the one I recommend. Um, Tradeback is that it, it does take a while to dry. The drawback is it takes a while to dry. But there are ways to expedite the drying and I've shown those ways and the um, behind the scenes for my Patreon members. It would, it would take way too long to explain that now. But in any case, the topic of our little conversation here is paint qualities, individual qualities, and the paints. It's something to take note of. And I wish someone had told me this um, in the past. Uh, I haven't really, I've met one person that used Williamsburg and I didn't really ask them why in the past. Or if I did, I didn't really uh, pay too much attention. You know, painting Rembrandt self-portraits really teaches you to uh, observe the uh, individual textures of each area of the painting. We're not there with the textures yet. Uh, we did put in that impasto layer, but I think uh, perhaps once this dries, we'll use the flake white to again try to uh, intensify the... Um, the textures of the portrait. But right now we're just going for shape and value.
I'm trying not to cover this area too much because in the Rembrandt you can really see the kind of transparent quality here so just lightly letting the paint drag there not too much at all Now you also want to look for areas that are the most quiet. So everything has a lot of stuff going on, uh, but this is the most quiet area. In the face. And I don't really try to encourage myself to have a copy mentality that we're doing what some can consider a master copy I tend to consider this a master study uh, but what I'm doing is a, a comparing uh, com really <laughs> there goes the English I'm comparing relative shapes to one another So if this is darker, it's darker relative to what? It's darker relative to that. Is it uh, further away from something? Further away from what? Is it further away from this? Is this further away from this than it is from this? So that's, that's all the stuff that's going on in my mind. And the reason I like to use comparative measurement um, is what you can call it versus uh, sight size or, you know, um, uh, tracing or something like that is that I try to mimic what it's like to work with a live model almost all the time and yes you can get perfect proportions if you use methods like sight size and um, it's certainly more accurate than than I would be getting here with uh, comparative measurement but I just find that there's something nice about not having to you know take out a, a, a scalpel or something and like try to measure everything and you know you have to take the derivative of ln of x to get uh, whatever integrate e to the x and then you get e to the x um, you know you don't have to use the quadratic formula or use a um, you know use a uh, transformation for a particular uh, partial derivative to of course I'm joking right you don't have to get too analytical with anything uh, and everything kind of builds up organically when you use comparative measurement but I also encourage you to explore the other methods as well
and we've just passed the 20 minute point. My battery is also telling me that's going, that it's going to die sometime soon, so I guess we should end this segment. That being said, I really hope that you enjoyed this footage. And as promised, here is a front and center view of the painting, uh, the area of the painting at least that we've been working on in this particular session. So after this session, uh, I'm going to go ahead and let this area dry and rework this painting on a later date. And of course I will be filming that and uploading the video in the intervals that I have been uploading them. Uh, remember, if you would like to take online classes with me, please check out um, patreon.com slash artist or go to the description box down below and you'll see links to the online classes. Remember in the online classes, students have uh, a project that I guide them through from start to finish. They also have extracurricular activities, uh, meaning these master studies, so this Rembrandt is going to be an extracurricular activity so they can send me they have the option of sending me images uh, by saturday each week for the virtual classroom we have a virtual classroom which provides teacher student feedback in the form of a video where i uh, go over their images using a drawing app uh, and then send them the images back uh, pretty much just like a live classroom a live in-person classroom but uh, a virtual classroom that being said thank you so much for watching these episodes i wish you the best in all of your artwork and i'll see you on the next one and it's now time for our new patron shout outs and so thank you thank you so much Bonnie Hall Gardiner. And thank you. Thank you so much, Wayne Cuffs. I'd like to thank you so much for all of your support on my Patreon account. I hope that you will enjoy the benefits, including the behind the scenes episodes, the live stream, the live chat as well as the online classes. Again, thank you so much for your support. Welcome to my Patreon. I wish you the best in all of your artwork, and I'll see you on the next one.